Hello everybody and welcome to the episode of the Creative Insider number 39. Uh, in this episode, I had the pleasure to talk to our first Indian guest, and that was Vamsi Krishna Vimuri. Um, I was a little bit sad because uh, he lives very close to me, but we couldn't record that in person. And he will come back for sure when the situation is a little bit safer, so to say. But yeah, it was a really amazing chat. Uh, so Vamsi, uh, he was passionate since uh, his childhood into computer programming. And he was also passionate about uh, design, of course, and design and architecture. And this was his drive to join the architecture university. Uh, first in Chennai, then he went to Birmingham, then he worked for a while, and then he felt he was a little bit off of his design path, so he designed, decided to join the Städel Schule here in Frankfurt, and um, this is one of the best schools in the world for conceptual architecture and digital architecture or digital design. And yeah, and he, we, he gathered a very wide skill set with which he founded many different companies uh, which were about building a visual experience a visual reality or about augmented reality and his last endeavor in particular is futurely futurely is an online platform about uh, learning these skills from vamsi and other experts in the field so it was a very very cool chat i suggest you to listen on but if you don't want to listen on this podcast you don't have to because we don't want to steal all your time or maybe you have many things to do or you don't know if you're gonna like this podcast or maybe you check it once in a while so i suggest you to join our newsletter because once a month we'll send you an email with the best of with a um, sum up of what happened in the month on the Creative Insider and you can decide yourself which podcast to listen and which not. So now if you just scroll a little bit down on the description of this podcast, you'll find the link to join.thecreativeinsider.com slash subscribe and there you can join our newsletter. And if you want to scroll still one more time down, you can find the links to all the major platform where you can listen to this podcast. I hope you enjoy the Creative Insider and yeah, enjoy our chat with Vamsi. The whole world stops just like that. Hello, Vamsi. How are you doing, man? I'm doing great, Georgi. How are you? Uh, as I you... hope you. I got your name right. Yes, you did. You did. Um, I How mean, far... I'm very excited to talk to you because finally we managed to do this podcast. Uh, but on the other side, I'm very sad because you would have been one of the few podcasts that I could do live because we live just a few kilometers away from each other. But I told that uh, due to safety in the current situation, it's better to, to do it online. And then I can tell you already now that as soon as uh, the situation here in Germany gets better, you can do one more podcast live and we can meet each other in person. It will be way funnier, I guess. Definitely. I think uh, it's strange the times we live in right now, especially the fact that, like you mentioned, we live super close by. And in fact, I was almost about to come to your office today in the morning. And uh, yeah, we are that close. And at the same time, yes, definitely when the things settle, we will grab a cup of coffee and even have a conversation again. I would yeah. love to. That would be nice because I've heard, so I'm going to yeah. tell the people a little bit how I found about you uh, because it's so funny. I was telling you also in the conversation before the podcast that uh, the circle of creatives is getting smaller and smaller, although people are 
that have participated are from everywhere. And um, when when somebody new comes at our office where I work, they put sort of uh, presentations of themselves uh, about what they do and where they have studied and so far. And then a few months ago, uh, Mado, your wife, joined our office and she put like a description about her skills with um, 3D and like 3D printed um, fashion, things like that. And I, I had just started this podcast and I thought that's a perfect guest. And then I went to her and told her, "Nice, like, hey, how about you coming to the podcast and these things? And she's like, oh, no, I don't know if I'm the best fit, but my husband is. And then she started talking about you and I was like, okay, whatever. <laughs> like we can do, oh, maybe next right. time when it's live, she, she could join too and we do just live uh with her too and will be a cool. definitely um, definitely so I'm, I'm yes I'm, I'm you can introduce a little bit yourself to the audience that doesn't know you or doesn't know everything like who, what you do and who you are so you can just uh, briefly introduce yourself to the audience for sure yeah um I am Vamsi Vamsi Krishna Vemuri I'm an architect and designer basically from India, but currently I'm based at Germany, Offenbach, Germany. And uh, currently I serve as the co-founder of Futurely, an online education platform for advanced architecture and design. So that's basically what I do. And uh, as an architect and as a designer, I have been wearing many hats during the course of the past few years. And things have taken me from... Uh, crazy directions, like graduating from an architecture school and then moving to Germany and doing a master's in design research here and now co-founding one company after another. That's where I am right now. Yeah, I think uh, your background is very interesting. And uh, you're the first guest from Asia on the podcast, which is like actually from Asia because we have had people who have lived there, but aren't from there and um i'm curious like if um you you became an architect a designer and um i don't know if i might ask you how old are you because i don't know that i'm 29 right now at the time of recording this podcast <laughs> in yes. 2021 so the future the future listeners are gonna know um, so it, it, was yeah. there a point in your life where um, you realized you wanted to do something with creativity, something with design, with architecture, or it was by accident or by someone that someone from your family or someone that you, someone that you know? I think, yeah, that's an interesting question. I don't uh, see it as an accident. I knew from a long time ago, ever since my childhood, that I was quite creative in general. And um, I was one of these geeks. You know, during the time, since six or seven, I used to meddle with uh, laptops and um, play video games, started learning programming when I was 11, and things like that. Uh, I, I developed a highly analytical and also a creative mindset in a way, because as much as I was a geek in the side of computers, I was also fascinated by video games, cinema, and a lot of creative applications. So I knew that somehow or the other, I would be jumping into a field where I will be meddling with a lot of CG animation or graphics. So that's how it all uh, started to begin. So being a gamer, especially, you know, you constantly, um, consume a lot of world design, you study, you analyze, and you kind of immerse yourself in this uh, digital space. That's one of the most interesting aspects for me, I think. And for some really interesting reasons, uh, instead of going into that side of uh, design, because back in the day, uh, you know, coming from an Indian family and uh, Indian background, you don't have uh, a lot of uh, information about the creative fields because mostly in South of India, where I come from, 
you're often pointed towards engineering or medicine, medical-based education as two of the most prominent career options. And But my parents were really uh, cool and comfortable with the way I wanted to pursue my career. And uh, so we kind of found an interesting middle ground. And that was what was architecture. It wasn't even my first option. It was, in fact, my third option because I decided one day that I don't want to get into uh, programming because that inf- initially was my first love, to be honest. I was really analytical and top of the class, but deep down, I knew that I probably am a b- better off in some creative domain. And that's when I started uh, looking at architecture. And uh, luckily for my dad, my dad's an academician. He served as a principal and professor of multiple universities. And he introduced me to architecture through some professors. And I meddled with 3ds Max when I was in my 10th grade. And that's how I decided that this is a field that's pretty exciting. And I thought I can definitely do something in this space. And that's how I got into architecture. Uh, that's that's really fascinating, and uh, like you, you break uh, you broke some cliches in the beginning with the medical school and engineering because uh, in the in the West that's sort of a cliche about Indian people that they're very good at these things, um, and they actually are. But um, what kind of academical is your dad? Like in which field? Because I, I don't think he's imagine. a mechanical engineer by education, and he holds two PhDs. Okay, so I guess you have a very smart background, like very smart genes in your family, so nothing surprising. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I think I, I think it's cool what you said because you said like you started learning programming when you were 11 and uh, then you turn into design. But I mean, if, if we take design, uh, it's a sort of an um, algorithm or the design that the result of each design even if it's architecture or whatever other design it's just the result of an algorithm of operations that gives you a certain result so i think it's just a, that that's a physical result of some sort of programming that is certainly true and i think uh, this whole idea of talking about algorithms and programming and computation, it's kind of crawling into every different field that we see. It's no more just um, saying that computer science is an independent subject, but in each subject, there is a bit of these uh, attributes that start getting added. And uh, yeah, I think that's the most fascinating part of it. And architecture being one of the most physical disciplines, it still has the opportunity to get uh, a lot of value and a lot of uh, amazing automations and things like that these days through the whole aspect of programming. Yep. Yeah, actually, that's a topic that we have touched in other podcasts. Uh, for example, we have had also the computational specialist from Bjork Ingels Group in New York, Oliver Thomas. Um, he was on the podcast number 30 and um, we were talking about this thing that, for example, um, architects and creatives uh, don't feel like they will be affected by some sort of AI. But I always say, like, if you see back in the days how many people were drawing one building and today we do the same job and we're just maybe three or five people. And um, today we... We're checking also the new version of Revit and it's more and more integrated. For example, you have automatic scattering functions or optimization of every, like the the number of people sitting in a room or the view. And it's getting more and more, um, like more and more design. It's getting more like a cooperation between human and the computer intelligence. Yeah, and machine. Uh, but I'm, yes. curi- I'm curious to start from the beginning of your background because, uh, okay, you discovered this this software when you were 10th grade and then you figured out that you wanted to, to go in that direction. And at which point did you join university and which university you joined? Okay. So 
Yes, that is true that um, I started off my journey with a lot of CG and animation based approach. And that's where I looked into 3ds Max. I was introduced to that because that and Maya were one of my biggest fascinating dream software back in the day. Because whenever I dig into cinema or dig into how some games were made, a lot of people used to mention these and how fascinating it is to use these tools in such a sophisticated industry and produce work. And when I realized that that's the kind of things that you could meddle with in architecture and also be creative, um, I took that as my main goal. And I joined a university called SRM in Chennai, Chennai, South of India. That's where I'm basically from. And it's a private university. It is kind of similar to most of the uh, traditional uh, educational programs around the world, I think. And uh, what's really interesting for me there is that uh, I think uh, before we, you know, uh, let's say talk about or take these uh, assumptions that I come from an intellectual background, I definitely am not. I was pretty mediocre in my education and uh, I had a super rough start being a non-social person back in the day as well in my university. But I had this uh, ambition that I picked a field that I really believed in and I thought I should give my blood and sweat to it in a way. And since a lot of odds did not work in my favor in terms of my um, your university life, all my energies and forces, they were kind of channeled towards acing the game. Like I really wanted to learn different dimensions of architecture. So that's how I ventured into it. Cool. And um, talking about, uh, yeah. yeah. No, no, go ahead. Yes, yes. So that way I really uh, developed this fascination for the subject. and. One of the biggest addictions uh, that I developed during the time was competitions. And architecture industry was one of the most uh, special fields that way because in the other um, domains, in engineering or um, medicine or the other stuff that's out there, you don't really have this sort of... Uh, social engagement and uh, competitive engagement because most architects or architecture projects, they are rewarded and they are won based on uh, competition results. And that's how it, it works even in the profession. And I was introduced that at a very early stage of my architecture education. So ever since then, I used to grab that as an opportunity, work with people and do our best to participate in competitions. And, and since I was kind of competitive back in the day, I was always focused on it and it became like a drug. And I was going on with that, you know, I participated in at least 15 to 20 competitions in my four or five years of architecture. Did you manage to win any? Like, or was more like, yeah, at least fifty uh, percent of them we wanted. <laughs> so, but you were yeah. you were you said you had like um, problems to re to relate like social relationships to develop like so social relationships um, in architecture world, especially in the competition field. It's more like about the teamwork, also because not only because of the workload, but also because ideas of multiple. Uh, minds join together have better result so did you do those uh, um, alone or in a team or how did you work uh yeah that's a really interesting point it is true that um i did not have a lot of social uh, life like most other students but what i managed to find are some really interesting people during the course who shared the kind of same uh principles and the same enthusiasm to do things. And uh, what happened over time is 
this is one of my biggest takeaways from my whole uh, undergrad career where i got to work with really different people like people i have no idea about no clue about and each and every time it was a different person or a different team and you know in the whole process you kind of learn the team dynamics understand how it works with different people and there is this sort of an empathetic exchange that happens and i think that's one of the biggest learnings for me especially that you can let go of your ego and you can work with a lot of creatives and still produce amazing work which most architects and designers fail to recognize i think i think also what is very diff- difficult to to do in a team in an architectural team especially at this level as you were a student is to find um other people that are as motivated as you would be to to do a competition and to win it eventually um this for example because i i i, I wasn't obsessed so much uh with competitions but um i was obsessed with doing right. but with doing the 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 best drawings i i really loved um for me uh drawing was like for you programming so i really loved like uh, i would nice. in my some of my first podcasts when i was starting this podcast i was telling that i would go and take an image of um no matter what kind of drawing of an architectural firm and try to reverse engineer it so i would like try to see okay which colors are those colors that they use and why i like these colors uh how they represented shadows trees everything and um but when i wanted to do something like a competition i wouldn't find people that were willing to you know put the extra hours that you should put and things like that and um that for me was a difficult thing to find in in university um right so how did i you, think uh, that all did you had enough of yeah, those people please go on. did you have enough of those people uh, in your university back then actually it's not like everyone uh, i worked with were the best fit but at the same time i realized that um, each person has a different dynamic and a different a different expectation from working in a team and uh, i was able to f- blend in and kind of fit well with these different mindsets and different attitudes and that's what was my major takeaway of course after working on so many competitions i ended up building or having a, an amazing team of friends we are like four to five people who kind of grew together until our final year of architecture and that's how it all happened but it was a lot of testing process and working with multiple people until you realize and since i was not so um, social as i previously mentioned as well there was an emotional disconnect when it comes to working on uh, these competitions and projects it's not like he's my best friend or he's my really good friend so i'm going to work with him but i rather was really keen and interested on people who had some alignment towards achieving a particular goal or achieving some something through these uh, this engagement and that way i was fortunate i must say to get this kind of an exposure back in the day and i'm really curious how was the environment in the university in india because um i studied um i don't know if you know but i have studied uh, in rome i'm originally from bulgaria but i moved when i was a kid with my family to italy and then uh, i right. i accessed the um, the um, one of the oldest university it's the la sapienza university in rome and um i ac- accessed like the the difficult the, in in rome you have two options you can do bachelor and master as everywhere or you can do just a master which is 5 years and that's very difficult to to get in and i got in there and then i didn't like the environment there because it was very theoretical it was more about stuff that weren't very connected to design it was more about history of architecture or statics mathematics and like 
in the end of the day, ah. not everything was designed. It was just a few things were designed. And then the people in the university were very douchey because the university is like very, like in the core, in the center of the city. And there are a lot of people from that part of the city. And like they were super, you know, like we were just the first year and nobody knew anything about architecture. And they were very like already leaving the this <laughs> douchey spirit of architecture. And, and I'm curious, what was what is the approach in a in a place like India, which me personally I, I haven't had the opportunity to discover so much. Like, is more academical, or you rather more like practical? How it is? I think um, yeah, India in general is super aggressive and technology driven for most parts of India, and um, fortunately. Uh, most of my education was quite, uh, I had the freedom to do a lot of things that I wanted to. And I even, uh, because of the rapport that I developed with uh, the faculty and uh, the school in general, it gave a lot to me in return. I used to get time off from education to participate in these competitions and uh, things like that. Because at the end of the day, it was kind of supporting uh, the school's image as well. And they were supporting me in return with these kind of uh, liberties once in a while. And I was really fortunate that way. And me being a tech savvy person also had a lot of room to explore my interests and my passions in the process. You meant um, in which of uh like time off university, you would interrupt your like semester studies or you would ask the teachers to, for example, use a competition as your exam or how, what did you mean by that? Oh, well, if I have some competition deadlines, let's say I used to get, uh, like in India, they, they support you this way. They even compensate your attendance sometimes, or you don't have to, uh, come to the classes if you're onto something like that interesting. And uh, they are liberal in a way. I, I see. Because, for example, so, in, in, no, because I'm comparing with my background. Because in Italy, for example, they're very strict. And it's so weird because there are too many students. So they do just the same topic forever. Like if you join the university, because the different professors teach in a different years. Uh, and um, then if you, for example, now join a University of Rome and you happen to to st study the same class I did, you're most probably going to do the same project I did, <laughs> just the same topic. <laughs> so it was, and, and then I came in Erasmus here in Germany and Erasmus, I don't know if you are aware, it's the European exchange Yeah, 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 program. I'm aware. Yes. And uh, then they, there were some people that would go to a teacher and would be like, you know, we want to do this competition and uh, we can do the design for like, ex like to use this design as our, I don't know, semester design project or stuff like that. So this is what I was thinking. Right. Um, okay. Uh, what I got was as a privilege back in the day is that as long as I fulfill my submissions and expectations of each subject, I get to do this extra thing during the course hours and that's how I used to do it. So I had to manage both in a way. I I, I know that feeling. It was part of the curriculum. Yeah. I, the moment I started working, Sorry? it was the same for me. I was just only about, it was all, all about <laughs> architecture. But I think everybody who are uh, in the des any design field, they have moments of their life which was completely off <laughs> only about that one subject but i'm curious how that long, is true how long is the bachelor the bachelor degree in india you the, the the course you subscribed it's five years minimum okay five did you manage and, to do uh, it in five years so or? i i had to study for five years and uh, within which six months was like an internship period and Finally, in the fifth year, I do my thesis and then graduate. That's generally the format in India. Okay. So if you want to do a master's, it becomes two more years in addition to the five-year program. 
And uh, at which point of your academical career you uh, discovered about Germany and because uh, how exactly you, en you end up in, in Germany? Right. Uh, I think this brings me to an interesting point because um, Germany was not my first choice or an option. And um, before Germany happened, I had an international uh, exchange Uh, semester in the UK. I was in Birmingham, United Kingdom. And that was uh, my first experience while I was in undergrad. I was one of the few fortunate students who got selected for this program. And uh, I was excited and I went ahead. And so I get to spend six months in uh, UK. So I came with a lot of hopes and dreams and I was looking forward to this new uh, place, culture. But to be honest, I was taken back by surprise. When, um, when I went there, when I was there, unlike the uh, traditional Indian education system where we had school all day, every day, and we had like eight to nine hours of uh, classes each day. And when I went to the UK, I realized that it's only one day a week. And it was crazy when I thought about it because I went there assuming that I will get to spend a lot of time, meet a lot of people and have a lot of cultural exchange and work together and collaborate. But what happened in return was there were like 12 sessions in six months and that was it. This uh, took me back in a very strange way because that's not what I expected at all. And I became quite lethargic and uh, not so fascinated anymore. And I even missed two or three sessions of those 12 sessions. So that's how I felt like. But eventually, eventually, when the whole course happened, I was able to complete the project that was happening there in la the final two or three weeks. And that was it. And I came back successfully from there. I must say it wasn't uh, a fascinating experience at all. I have to be brutally honest about it. And I felt like I had more takeaways when I was doing my semester back in uh, my university. But at the same time, it was like uh, a sneak peek of seeing what these guys were doing. And then I realized maybe this is not my cup of tea right now. I didn't want to get into a master's immediately. And that was the kind of mindset I was developing until my um, fifth year. So my fi the final year of architecture, I finished my final year and I joined a practice. I think this was one of the most interesting points for me. Yorgi? Yeah, no, I hear you, I'm listening. Okay, yeah. So this was one of the most uh, interesting point for me because um, I took a really strong decision here at this point. Since design was my major uh, strength and my major forte, what I did was I joined a practice where I could learn everything other than design. This was uh, this firm that I worked with. It's called the Bargov Group. It was a Uh, really a really game-changing moment for me because I really wanted to learn the technical, the professional, and the business side of design. And that's how I jumped into there. And three months into it, I was fortunate, really fortunate, to be able to pitch a hospital project to a massive uh, client. And somehow these uh, team dynamics and some of the empathetic skills that I've been building, they started working really well for me. And that's how my professional career began. And during the process, I started playing a lot of roles and I wore many hats in the process. From being a designer, I started evolving into a more of a communicator and slowly started even fitting into the frame of negotiations. So the whole uh, 
the non-social side of me started becoming completely different and I started becoming a lot more uh, open, a lot more communicative. And it was a major transition that happened in my life. And I think this was one of the major uh, catapult kind of moment that happened. And it was also, in a way, a short-lived thing, you know. So after this whole two to three year period of acceleration, I hit a spot. It was a really uh, tough spot. It was like one of these moments where, you know, you kind of get up and you check yourself to realize what am I doing? Like, is this the uh, direction or is this the trajectory that I initially wanted to go? And when I look back, I started realizing that my fascination, my passion towards design, it's been slowly uh, getting rusty and it's fading away. And I started blending more into the commercial side of the practice. And that's when I realized that maybe this is not exactly the direction that I want to head to. And I felt like when I look forward to some 10 or 20 years from then on, I felt like this is going to be a monotonous thing. This is going to be probably financially profitable and viable, but then it's going to be super hard to come back and unplug out of it if I want to do something the way I wanted to do it earlier. And so that's when I decided to get a master's degree because I really need that needed that unplugging moment from my life, from that um, rush of professional practice. As much as I had a career catapult there, but I really wanted to get back to my roots of being a designer. And that's when I had a lot of options on the table, but somehow I preferred coming to Europe because, you know, again, avoiding an Indian stereotypical cliche, <laughs> most people go to the United States from India. And I decided to come to Germany. Luckily, uh, this was one of the best options that I had. And they had a really interesting program here. So that's how I landed here in 2017. Yeah, 2015 i'm very inter it, it's very interesting because um uh so you you came to the Städel Schule, right like this was your master university that's correct yeah that's I, correct um i was i was very curious about this story because um i came to frankfurt and i didn't know about this school and then i didn't know about this school for several years and then i, I figured out there is this this uh very high-end school of uh, design and um, where very famous designers and architects teach and um, it's not on there is architecture but there are also other kind of uh, arts and designs and um, yeah I was curious just to, to figure out how you that are from so far away um, and to to know about this university that was that was the most uh, interesting to me nice yeah i think uh, we had a lot of diaspora and alumni from uh, india who were a part there for the past 10 years in stadel and uh, that's how i got to know about the school and you know you were kind of being modest calling it a high end school but it's one of the tiniest schools i've ever been to <laughs> um, I, I didn't say it's big, but it's uh, apparently very like the, the things that you, you get uh, told there. It's very particular. It's sort of, I mean, for the people who don't know it, I think it's sort of the AA, it's like it's some similar thing as the AA School of Architecture just in Germany and Frankfurt. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. And uh, in fact, I came from an university which had 30,000 students and uh, so many disciplines. And this was a school where we had 30 people as a part of the class. And that was it. It was really shocking and surprising when I uh, came here because you expect some sort of infrastructure, some sort of uh, a luxurious uh, university experience. And then we were in a really interesting, intimate, home-like setting because the whole institution was like a four four floor building and that was it 
But what I really got to experience there was yet another game-changing moment in my life because it was a massive shift from real-world learning and real-world communications and bagging projects and things like that to a sort of a place of self-discovery. I think that's how I can put this whole Stadel experience as because the Stadel was more about you and how you want to perceive your ideas of architecture and design and come up with interesting uh, discursive ideas, theoretical concepts, and learning the most cutting edge contemporary uh, philosophy that's happening in the world. So that's the kind of atmosphere I was brought into. Uh, what I'm what I'm curious about this school, it's like, um... Because uh, I've got to talk to people also that have studied at the AA and um, I, I have this personal idea because I, I have experienced something similar uh, because I came from the biggest university of Europe. My university in Rome has all around the faculties uh, 60,000 students and there is wow. a, a, part, a part of the city which is called University City And it's sort of a very huge chunk of Rome, which is closed within uh, like sort of outside borders. And then inside you have the different buildings and then there are many buildings around the city scattered around. It's so crazy. And then I came here and it was also like a bigger, like it's bigger than the Städter Schule. I studied at the Fachhochschule in Frankfurt, but still every class would, right. have, would have like 20 people. It, it, it felt like because in... In Italy, in a design class, you, you would be 75. And then if the professor knows your name, it's in, you must have done something, whether stupid or good. <laughs> 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 and um, <laughs> the discussion, like my, but uh, although that university in Rome was so like sort of high end, you know, the name of the university and the one that I studied here wasn't that, you know, prestigious, so to say. Um Here we had so many uh, workshops, we had so many opportunities to build our models, we had like laser cutters and so many. So I had this sort of infrastructure to, no matter what kind of teaching the, the, the professor were giving me, I had the freedom and the facility to develop my ideas. And um, I was thinking, um, is it the same at this high-end school so that You get something taught by your teachers, but in the end you have uh, the, the very real asset is to have these facilities and the freedom to you personally to develop your skills. Because I think that if you're lazy, no matter who is teaching you, even if it's the best architect in the world, you won't be able to to be good because you won't put the work. That is needed. certainly true. That is certainly true. And I think um, it, doesn't really matter where we uh, study or graduate from. If you're lazy, you are just lazy and end of story. Uh, what happened with Stadel is Stadel is not the best known for infrastructure. Like they weren't really uh, equipped with a lot of fabrication equipment or uh, CNC cutters. Re in the recent uh, year, they got robotic arm and things like that. But what's more fascinating is um, they had some of the best faculty from different parts of the world coming and teaching in the space. And they were dealing with some exclusive subjects that deal with uh, design research. And I believe there are barely one or two universities in Europe, and there are just a handful of universities in the United States dealing with this topic. And I think that's the most fascinating part dealing with the contemporary uh, philosophy of design. And we had the opportunity of studying how Zaha Hadid became Zaha Hadid and um, how does Libeskind's work happen, the thought process happens. So we used to study the mindsets and ideologies of all these star architects. And so that was a really different approach. It was mostly disconnected from the building side of things, the structural side of things, but more towards the conceptual side of things, if I may say precisely. Yeah, I, I have, for example, 
uh, attended. You have like the open house day or open doors day uh, where students uh, like can have like they have their works in a sort of a small exposition. And uh, yeah, you as uh, me as somebody that comes from a more to more traditional university, I told okay, this I'm not even sure that's architecture. It's like cool, but I, it, I it's it's different. <laughs> it's a different <laughs> animal. Yeah, okay. yeah, it is in a way. Uh, I think I would like to quote uh, everything is architecture. That's how we approached it. Yeah, they were semesters and there were topics that we're dealing with uh you know spending time in the kitchens and uh, making dishes and also trying to dissect sections from them and make architectural drawings from them and analyze them study them and things like that and what's the best part here is for me i was able to rediscover my old self that started off you know this was the guy who a decade ago was fascinated with animation, gaming, and the first foremost fundamental things that brought him to architecture, I was able to discover all of that again here. And that's why I felt like an utopia for some reason. And I really enjoyed the experience. Yeah, and I think that uh, the, the addictive part of design and creativity in general is that is um, back to the beginning of our conversation when you were talking about algorithms and programming. It's like when you're given yeah. a task about designing something, it's sort of given a task to hack a code and then you start putting things together and then adjust them and then the final result, if you're happy with your result, it's... Uh, so nice because it feels like just put in place and there's this invisible power behind it because you have told something to guide the user or whoever is experiencing your design to think in that certain way and then um, it's it's really weird it's really freaky it's not like I, I feel like other fields that are more theoretical it's like you have to uh, for example if you're just an engineer that needs to to do some calculations you need to learn the formulas and learn the theory and then apply it but this is more like you have a puzzle so sort of like the ruby cube and then you need to move it around until it's get it's done yes yes i think uh, i would like to extend it from there to say that you know here in a way we were not solving problems but What's more funny and what's uh, more interesting to add to it is that we were creating problems. Like we imagine or we um, create fictional scenarios and then we see how our architecture or how our buildings can fit in that scenario. So that's how we started approaching it. It's almost like uh, the way you work, or the way you perceive a video game or a movie, you know, in a game or a movie, you have your own fictional rules based on which it is made. And within that rules, how does the movie play out? How does the story play out? That's how we started approaching architecture in this, the way I did it at the school. Yeah, but I think uh, actually it's very funny because I, I, I have talked about this topic that also presenting your project should be like a story, presenting like... A story, what every story is that you have this, uh, your main character, your hero, which starts from somewhere, uh, finds him, yeah. himself or herself in trouble and goes through an adventure to solve the trouble, the, the problem. And that's what it's every design task, no matter, no matter what it is. You're a designer, you get a task which doesn't have a solution and then you go deep down and then up again. And so... <laughs> That's uh, I think it's uh, cool that you that you said that because it shows how a lot of designers thinks very much alike. It's sort of you know, uh, sort of a mathematical result somehow. Um, but I forgot to ask you before: <laughs> Is it hard to get into this Städteschule? Do you need to apply in somehow with a CV, with a portfolio, or something, or how does it work to get in? Uh, yeah, you need to apply it. Uh, the traditional way through your CV and portfolio, it 
but uh, they pay more attention to the portfolio because they want to see a lot of design centric projects and that's how they filter out the applications yeah and um i was curious uh, could, could you mention some of the t- people who who came by to teach while, while you were studying there it's it's two year right or three how many years did you study there yeah it, it was two years and um one of the most fascinating uh, things was we had people like tom main from morphosis architects coming in and checking out our final projects and we had uh people like hernan diaz from cyarc giving guest lectures and also dropping by in between and some of the contemporaries uh, like mark wigley who is a uh, from columbia university and most of these guys who used to drop by they are from the ivy league schools or uh, top of the class in their practice but at the same time a little more theoretically grounded and um, design centric people but not completely into the practice side of things so that such are the kind of people who used to drop by and jury or uh, present their work yeah i i have had also in former studio where i worked i worked for a brief period of time at cma architects here in frankfurt and they had a lot of uh, graduates from from that school and some of them would go sometimes to the final final presentation of the projects to to help out as a jury so there was a little bit of a uh, stedel mafia in in that in that office because <laughs> there were quite a few and was uh uh was crazy and they were to- telling me stories that back in the days also Ben van Berkel from uh, oh yes when yes studio yeah. was often there and things like that um <laughs> uh and um, um you completed the studies uh you 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 graduated um and um what what happened then did you how did you transition here in germany because you 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 mentioned before when you were in india that you you started working and then of course the profession led you in a in a way that you didn't want to and when you were here how did you transition from this academical uh, environment to being a professional or you're freelance now i don't know have you been always independent how 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 was here like your professional transition right i i think um i was at every given point i was uh, practicing until uh, 2018 i can say in fact only in 2019 i stopped uh, practicing architecture uh, when i mean practicing i even though i used to um, i studied and i did my masters here i was remotely connected and i used to work with the practice in uh, chennai that i told you about initially because um, somehow i developed a really uh, strong connection with the management and uh, i used to participate in a lot of competition projects i used to get to travel every 2 months to india because of that from germany that was one of the privileges i had and that's what i graduated with and one of the things uh, that hits you really hard when you graduate from stadel is you are really not ready for the normal life the professional life because the stadel puts you in such utopia that you really wish everything is like that afterwards but reality kicks in and it's never like that <laughs> that's true i think uh, here yeah i would like to mention you know our tutor used to say that most people who graduate from stadel they will be like where is my pritzker now <laughs> that's the kind of question that pops up nice <laughs> cuz most of the time they spend criticizing and uh, commenting about works of um, zaha or levisskind or frank gehry and you really think that you're on the same page but until you graduate you don't realize it at all <laughs> yeah it's true so yeah what happened with that is um i graduated and i had a dream that uh, this is one of my goals that i really wanted to achieve which is to start my own practice and 
after the stadel one of the major disruptions happened is that like we were just discussing and many things can be architectural and architecture as a discipline can extend into many fields and so that's where um, i found my forte i think that that was one of my um, revelation moments because i realized that i am more interested in the digital side of the architecture practice and not the building side of it simply because yeah simply because i felt um, that there is a lot more that i could contribute there's a lot more that i could engage with being in the digital side of things because i was fascinated uh, always with the idea of uh, remote working and uh, staying more global and things like that and that's where um, i really could not apply and join a practice in germany i didn't want to because on one hand i had this really uh, good practical engagement with um, the firm in chennai where i could associate and travel once in a while and do my thing and on the other hand if i were to join here or if i were to start my career again it's almost like a reinvention because somehow architecture is like a really regional practice right whatever learning and application that i have from back in india unfortunately cannot be applied here and i have to start from square one again yeah that's true yeah and uh, i realized that it's a lot of time and energy too and i realized also that um, my german is actually quite bad even today <laughs> the maximum amount of deutsch that i can say is uh, nbc and deutsch and uh, that's how i start my conversations with most people so um i was so invested in the work and i picked up this fascination for vr virtual reality during the school and that was my guiding uh, light for the next couple of months and an year in fact i really wanted to see what i could do with this medium because virtual reality has always been fascinating for me ever since i got introduced to it in 2016 i think and i spent more than 7 to 8 months traveling around the whole of europe attending a lot of conferences a lot of vr events and i used to also fly back in between to india and uh, keep doing the practice that that was how i started um, converting or con- uh, sort of building a foundation for uh, becoming an entrepreneur that's that's how it began basically and 2018 is one of the most glorious years for me as a professional and before futurely happened uh, which i initially mentioned i started a company called fluxreal and it was more centered towards developing immersive technology and experiences in the field of design and architecture so i started studying it meeting people networking with a lot of people understanding how things work remotely and connecting with a lot of designers and we were trying to build some experiences in house in vr and that's how my journey kind of pivoted from uh, a conventional architecture practice into a creative design based learning in stadel and then to this whole virtual space in vr which i wanted to pursue as a professional and so these kind of jumps really uh, helped at every point because there was something to learn from each phase and i started building uh, a company completely on the cloud and we built a team a really small team of 4 to 5 people and this was one of the biggest uh, lessons for me in my life during the 1 to 1.5 years 1 and 1/2 years of my uh, building and working with this practice i was able to build a really good brand a brand that was starting to get more recognition more uh, uh features 
everywhere across the globe in a way. But at the same time, I started focusing on one of the biggest uh, cliche mistakes that everyone does, which is, you know, you're out of this uh, amazing architectural school and you believe that you want to change the world with this kind of design and you don't understand the customers, you don't understand how uh, the markets work again and you just want to make a project and then try to sell it to your client. So that's the kind of transition I was facing. And in this process, there was this sort of a battle on one side, I was involved in building my brand. On the other side, I was running out of cash. I was burning cash. That's how it started happening. There was this constant struggle in the process. I see. But I, I think that now that <laughs> you start with the, what was what was your what was your actual first uh, uh, product you were like selling with your your, your virtual uh, reality business? Well, we were making experiences for different clients. I even had the opportunity to work with uh, an artist here in uh, Germany and uh, curated an augmented reality-based exhibition for them and a few other projects in Europe. Uh, what happened here is that uh, when I went, took this approach, I was doing really niche and really exclusive product uh, projects. And, but this whole technology and this whole uh, approach was quite new and fresh and not knowing the language, not knowing uh, how to navigate the business channels in Germany put me on a interesting spot. It was really difficult for me to uh, move further. And this was another, uh, what to say, a really crucial moment for me because I took a huge leap of faith after my education and I wanted to pursue this. So one of the things that I also got wrong was I was also pursuing my uh, architectural career on the side, which was another excess baggage. You know, most often when you want to pursue entrepreneurially, I think we need to start letting go of those baggages that you carry and then you can invest a lot of heart and soul in what you want to do and pursue it in a much better direction. So that was one of the major learnings that I took from this company and the way I approached it through the whole uh, process. So I would say one and a half years since the beginning, I lost a complete team which got dissolved and then I had an amazing brand which was standing out. <laughs> so that was the spot I was left with. But um, I mean, of course, with a with a bunch of learning from the process. Uh, but, yes. But um, I'm also curious. Um, how did you manage? Like, where was your company based? Because uh, I, I guess as an Indian and to live here in Germany, you need sort of a visa or something. Uh, so did you? Need, That's right. Did you need to base your company yeah. here in Germany so that you can live here, or how how was that working like? Uh, Yes, I was actually um, freelancing here with my company registered in India. That's how I was navigating the channels. I see. And um, but yes. this 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 company is like I don't know. I I haven't started anything else a part of this podcast. And <laughs> right, like, like I I have uh, I have these fascinations about the same thing as you do, but. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, I think that I'm uh, still figuring out what exactly I I want to do, and um, this was my starting point to you know start connecting with people and understand what are what other are doing and um, sort of show their their backstage, you know, so that other people understand the what really happens in the kitchen, and. Um, right. I think maybe this business, you, the first business you started, that wasn't the the right timing. Maybe because right now in these times we are living, where we cannot meet, this sounds to me like a gold mine. You know, like if you create, 
if you create like virtual rooms where we can like experience something like a real meeting uh, I mean, I suggest you to <laughs> to to re 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 <laughs> re arise that company. I, I'm I'm sure that now it's uh, more thriving times for that. Um, but um, and the, and then you you did this company for for how long? For like a year or two? Or yeah, I uh, pursued it for one and a half year, and uh, so mostly when I started it, I decided that. I'm going to use all my learning so far, my five plus two years of architecture and my creative knowledge from different fields uh, and mainly architecture and apply it in this whole virtual uh, reality scenario and this whole immersive experience, this scenario. And that's how I started this. Yeah, you're completely right about the fact that the world was not ready for it yet. And it was a super niche field Uh, back in the day and having this disadvantage of um, language was another uh, aspect that kind of set me back but at the same time there were some amazing things and amazing people that I discovered in the process and I personally think that that year 2018 was like a journey of self-discovery across Europe and Asia for me So this is where I kind of understood the strengths, the weaknesses of mine, especially, you know, it is it is hard to take a leap of faith into something that's not ventured before by you and that's a little new for you. But at the same time, I realized that I have made the first step of taking a leap of faith into it. But the second step was that assessing and reevaluating if if it's the right timing or if it's the right field for you to jump and take a dive into it was something that I did not calculate. And I think taking a calculated uh, assessment or calculated risk was something that I learned that I need to have in mind after after that experience. So moving on, fast forwarding, you know, uh, As a part of the process, while working with this company, I learned or I got to work with amazing professionals from different domains like interaction design, um, UX and UI design, and uh, some coding-based people, some developers in the space. And there was a lot to take from that. I think when I realized that... Um, when this whole thing did not pan out the way that I wanted to, when I started looking back and when I started uh, making an assessment of the things that I earned and learned in the process, I really felt like I have a new opportunity to reinvent myself and rediscover myself in this uh, process. And I, I landed a really interesting project in 2019, which was uh, a huge tech project, and it was based in Switzerland. And it was, again, uh, to do with developing a platform and in virtual reality. So I started off, it, was, it kicked off really well, and uh, that was one of the most hopeful moments for me again. And I traveled back and forth between Germany and India, I started to build a team and uh, get people together and had a lot of uh, connections, conversations and learning from each other and kicked off until the pandemic hit. <laughs> so the pandemic changed the game. So I was working with a startup earlier until that point and uh, their fun flow was affected and a lot of things happened. There was this, again, a sudden stoppage that happened for me personally uh, because of the whole situation. And I was really uh, left clueless and I was again trying to bring myself back up and kind of patch myself and still be resilient and keep moving forward. And that's when my amazing friend and uh, partner right now, Arik, he stopped by on an online conversation 
we were discussing you know also as a part of one of the things that i ventured into and uh, like took a dive into i took a dive into uh, teaching workshops and education so i used to uh, travel around um, europe and uh, asia and i used to conduct a lot of um, design based workshops architecture workshops some of them based in vr and some of them based in advanced tools in learning and sculpting and things like that and my partner arik was also a professional in the space and he had um, his own gig going on in armenia and this was all cut to the chase the pandemic is on the whole world is halted and we really were held up and stuck with the things we were doing because of various reasons and that's when we had this random idea one fine day and we thought what if we make this whole learning experience online what if we make and connect with a lot of people that we never used to before online and how do we do this how do we pursue it this is where the whole conversation started and we brainstormed for weeks and months and that's how futurely was born um and um i'm curious um before you start putting these ideas into practice um do you have a method or do you have a way of testing their the ideas uh making what is called like the mvp like the minimum viable product which would be like some very primitive idea of your product which you release to check the interest of people into buying into whatever you want to sell so was in your process uh, something like a testing moment or you generally just go and uh, see how it goes you're uh, asking about futurely uh, in, in general? general because i mean whatever like i i guess that when you started your first company and then you even if even, even if it didn't end up the way you wanted um you have yeah. learned a lot about running a, a business or a practice no matter what kind of of practice it is because yes i guess that when you start i mean i'm doing at this podcast which is not even profitable and then you have to take care of so many things and then you just learn how to organize them and then just by repeating the process for example you find small things that you can adjust and make better and then slowly gets a little bit better and um i'm curious um if you have from your from your first business if you have take, taken some concepts that you applied into starting this new practice which is something seem like you're probably teaching your skills that you have learned from your past but it's a new field it's a new business i think uh, that's a wonderful question yorgi thank for thanks for bringing it up uh, definitely i think uh, my first business was one of my biggest learning playgrounds for me in venturing into the second space this whole futurely uh, initiative because um having worked with a lot of tech side of uh, people what i really learned is uh, the whole idea of testing iterating and uh, repeating a product and releasing an mvp getting feedbacks there's the cycle that's maintained and then you develop a second version a third version and multiple versions so those are some things that i really got introduced to and i really believe that uh, this is the kind of approach that we should start applying in um, architecture and design and most often these kind of approaches are more prevalent in uh, programming and developing a digital product how do we take it into our discipline how do we start incorporating these things in our domain was something that really fascinated me and uh, not just that one other thing i'd like to bring up from uh, my learnings was how do people like tech companies like github are a great example because github is one of the uh, only companies 
in the world which is completely remote and they have a manual that's available for everyone to uh, download and you, we can learn from them on how they set up a billion dollar uh, remote business so they have this sort of a manual that dictates the roles guidelines responsibilities the different nuances that happened in a company and how do we maintain how do we sustain have the same productivity that you would have in a physical space and still be able to run a profitable business so such are the kind of uh, things you get introduced to a lot of productivity tools you get um like i got exposed to a lot of um, what to say task management uh, programs and communication programs and also discussion panels discussion channels and we even at a point started collaborating with each other in virtual reality and so that's how we started harnessing all these uh, learnings and applying it into a new business so like you uh, coming back to your question we did develop an mvp it wasn't uh, exactly a finished product but then we had a methodology and we had an idea of how we wanted to do a workshop experience how we wanted to create a learning experience and that's how we kick started futurely oh um i i think it's uh uh also very interesting to get to know what is like the because um you know if you m- might be familiar like the the learning curve uh it's uh increase like if you want to learn something you really uh first learn it then try to do something out of what you have learned and you master it for real when you teach it to someone else and um i guess it wasn't easier to develop um a teaching method uh so um, first of all i'm curious what exactly do you teach on futurely uh and like i mean i guess you're not the only teacher there and um, yeah. how did you set up because if you teach something which is a high end method or technology or software is it meant for someone who is already into this field or it could be i mean of course it's meant for designers i guess uh but yes if for example you're teaching some software which i don't have any knowledge about can i still join futurely programs or something like that? so if you could explain me like what was the process to generate these courses for sure. and who are they targeting for sure uh one thing that i would like to uh, like quickly mention or bring back is like i told you earlier so i had this uh, learning and also experience from conducting a lot of workshops and events across um, different continents and uh, there were some really key attributes that we used to enjoy and we used to cherish when we have a live event because most often i don't have um, a traditional academic university type of uh, teaching experience but i rather have a really uh, short intense workshop teaching experience and the way we come together from different parts of the country or sometimes different parts of the world and it's like 20 30 of us collaborate and we work 8 hours to 12 hours round the clock each day and produce a project in 5 days or a week so we had like a methodology in place that usually works in a physical event and what we started to see or this was one of the challenges that we first put across the table like how do we bring the same essence the same flavor into a virtual space and that's how it all started and we started looking at a lot of programs testing a lot of programs and we were trying to build an methodology and experience for the participants so talking about the uh, kind of topics that i used to teach i was primarily uh, experienced with zbrush as a modeling tool and um, i use a lot of unreal engine and also some uh, vr applications and rendering appli- applications real time applications 
So these are the things that we use to build and create virtual experiences. So that's how it started off with uh, me at Futurely as well. And one of the most beautiful things about Futurely is you know one fine day that, you know, when you're building something way larger than yourself, you just want to completely surrender to it and give your fullest to it. So that's how, that's the kind of mission we started this um, whole channel with, the initiative of Futurely. And we really knew from day one that it's not about uh, me or my partner alone that is going to teach, but we rather wanted to create a platform, a space for a lot of architects and designers from different backgrounds, different expertise to come together and teach different people across the world. So one of the major challenges here is um, there is a lot of content out there. There's a lot of um, pollution out there especially since the start of the pandemic, it grew even more with the kind of uh, excessive generation of content, excessive generation of workshops, webinars. Podcasts. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't particularly say that. Yes, they were. But most audience or most uh, people who consume it, they really didn't know what to pick or what to choose. And that's where we believe that we want to support and help a lot of newcomers into the space and a lot of existing uh, intermediate users or expert users also to benefit from the platform. So right now, we are kind of taking that as the challenge and uh, we are focusing on how to reach more globally to different parts of the world, different parts of uh, uh, <clears throat> different stages of architecture, like people from first year to final year, how can they get access to this sort of learning from experts from uh, Zahadid architects or uh, experts in different uh, topics and countries? So that's the kind of cross-pollination or cross-exchange that we're trying to build here. I see. And um, the, all the lessons are mostly focused on this uh 3D modeling and 3D design and parametric design, computational design, and uh, uh, this this realm realm of uh, topics. Actually, um, yeah. Now that you ask, this is something that a lot of people believe that futurely is more about the uh, digital side of design and uh, having more procedurally generated forms or computational design forms, things like that. <laughs> but at the same time, we are working on a model right now to integrate a lot more uh, professional side of design, practice side of architecture into the process and see how we can really bring that flavor as well into the platform. The reason why we had a more uh, digital side of things is because as founders, these were one of the uh, core areas of expertise that we had and we shared and we kick-started the whole uh, process through it. But now that we are taking a step back and we would love to bring a lot of professionals on board and curate the whole experience. That's what we are focusing on right now. And um, you were mentioning also in the in the conversation early, like a few minutes ago that you also try to figure out a way so that people although they're getting this um, this uh, workshop or classes uh, from from different spots on on the planet so to say to have them experience it in the same way as you were in the same place um, what does that yes what that that does that look like how do you try to achieve this goal because this for me if if you have developed um, a method that's valid, and this might be also a, a model to 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 teach or sell. Because, for example, right now would be uh, crucial all around the world, not only for teaching designers but for teaching, for example, kids too. Because 
Um, I can tell you like briefly before you answer these questions that recently I have been doing a lot of uh, lots of research about how to improve my my podcast on a uh, media quality and sound and things like that. And I found this um, right. channel on YouTube from this guy who's called Tom Tom Buck, and he's an American right. teacher. And he's a teacher in America in. I don't know if it's a high school or a college. I think it's a high school, and uh, he teaches media and and he teaches on, he shows on you on his YouTube channel uh, how he has made this special room in the school so that the different teachers can stream stream their lessons, and they have multiple cameras, and the whole system doesn't cost like a million of dollars. It costs just a few. Maybe with a few thousands you can make it. And for me, right. this idea that you can make a stream, like because here in Europe, uh, I don't know how it's around the world. A lot of, uh, particularly Italy, Germany, they say, okay, this distance teaching doesn't work because the kids don't get it. But <laughs> I think that's also like the teacher. I did, I didn't hear a teacher that said. But I don't know how to do it cool. Like because if I have a teacher that streams and has multiple cameras and has some sort of cool interaction methods, like I don't know, in this new online software, you have like you 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 put your hand up or stuff like that. So yeah. if you if you have an interactive and funny way to 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 and you have to have it in 2021, it might be cool. Yes. And I think that. Uh, schools right now instead of pushing for reopening as it is possible so far should push for making a valid method to involve students of every single age instead of investing on I don't know weird other stuff I uh, totally agree to that and uh, I think they can rather not invest a lot more on physical infrastructure but they can develop a lot more better model and better quality to engage remotely or even online because that's highly possible now that everyone's tasted it and uh, to your question i think you have already mentioned or specified one of the key aspects which is interaction that is something that's uh, lacking highly in the traditional um, education formats um even i come from a school which had super minimal interactions and uh, back in the day and one of the major thing that we try to destabilize or remove is we try to remove the idea of hierarchy we have a highly casual attitude the way we uh, do things and everyone who engages with us are our participants and they themselves have different backgrounds and different levels of experience so there's always a give and take you know it's not like you're having this huge monologue lecture where you stand in the middle center of the hall on a pedestal and then you're just addressing your audience that's not how it happens here we try to have a conversational engagement with people where people can actually stop us ask questions during the course of the sessions and get their answers in return and they're really happy and the best part is it doesn't just uh, stop right there even once the class is over we have these uh, support channels uh, which we call the after hours support on uh, discord and few other uh, media platforms where people get to ask each other people get to interact with the tutor and they get their questions resolved and we also have a lot of initiatives where people start submitting their work they share uh, each other's um, progress of their assignments and prog uh, projects and that way there is this active discussion and active engagement that keeps happening and when you know that you know that the whole instructor your instructor is accessible and your instructor is always there to support you and solve your problem or if not from the instructor you have the community that's there to help i think the automatic tendency is to engage more to do more and to just have fun in the process 
Yeah, I think that's that's crucial. And um, as a, someone that has been more involved into this field and this um, subject, um, what can you say about what is the status of development of further um, gear sort of uh, like now it's already kind of popular the oculus which are this you know glasses where emerge you in a um in a in a virtual space in a virtual reality uh do you think we're yeah. getting closer and closer to i was wondering about it that um building a real building or real architecture it's very you know hard process from a point of view of costs from a point of view of yes. materials, ecology, space. We have finite, finite space on this earth, so we cannot use it all. And um, yeah. also now we have discovered this pandemic. And um, do you think soon when, I mean, when this technology is accessible to the majority of people, which will be sort of a smartphone, do you think that the future of, To, through this technology gear, future of architecture will be more uh, virtual and so to say also maybe unlimited because in virtual reality you can have the craziest building that flies and whatever. <laughs> yeah, I, um, I have to say I strongly believe in that and I believe uh, we are slowly heading there. It is, uh, like you mentioned, it's a matter of accessibility at this point and a lot of people are still not used to uh, these devices yet. And one of the things that I can quote from my own experience, I'm someone um, who, who uses VR almost on a daily basis, either for working out or testing out new applications. I feel like some of the most successful applications on VR that you can uh, try on are the ones that are super simple. At this point, you cannot have someone strap on these goggles and ask them to do push a lot of buttons or press, uh, move your controller in multiple directions. People are simply not habituated to this behavior. And that's, I think, one of the interesting challenges because on the technological front or the app development front, they are able to make uh, sophisticated uh, applications, sophisticated video games and things like that. But they are really, really uh, losing on the experience point of view, the user experience point of view. And once that's kind of settled, I think augmented reality and virtual reality will have a huge room to play in the near future. I agree with you and I'm on the same page. So I, I think um, um, I think that will be the future. And uh, uh, do you think, like, the, if I misunderstood or understood right, Uh, if somebody joins um, the, the classes of Futurely, is there a sort of uh, education in the direction to teach your um, students or the participants uh, to build those uh, virtual reality uh, spaces, so to say, or yeah, realities actually? Uh, is that also part of, yeah. your, of your... And again, in this case... Um In this specific skill, which do you need to have us already a base knowledge, or you can start from zero and reach a decent level or high level? What do you say about it? I think um, you know the best example that I could quote about this is uh, the event that we conducted in September and October. It was. Uh, based on virtual reality and we were four instructors and we had around 150 participants from different 40 countries across the world with some of them have zero level experience and some of them had um, intermediary experience and some of them had good experience levels too and uh, we worked with them for six weekends and we were able to produce uh, 11 stunning interesting worlds in VR by them. And it was just uh, fascinating even for us as tutors to see the potential and possibilities the way they took it forward 
maybe after the chat i will even uh, share with you the links of those worlds you can test it out too on your uh, computer we can we can put all these links actually in the description of this podcast so all the listeners also will be able to 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 see what we're talking about um and you mentioned absolutely you mentioned this this workshop uh, was for six weekends six weeks uh what is the, the yeah. roughly like i guess it depends on the different workshops well, what is the rough cost to participate into this uh yeah. these workshops we uh price it at 200 euros for early bird registration and 250 for regular registrations that's how we priced it and and how often and uh, how some often do you have were available for purchase separately as well yeah and how many how many a year how? you do we intend to do three or four uh, such series of workshops uh, this year and we are uh, planning on our next series as well right now and uh, so this is one format where we have this kind of a six or five week in the course which builds towards one huge massive final project and the other formats that we have are uh, one time events and uh, recorded courses that are coming up on the platform those are something that's happening in parallel as well so yeah that's the kind of formats uh, that we're currently working with and uh, so again bringing uh, the idea of uh, vr and uh, one of the key things that we learned ourselves as well is that most um designers they even at different levels of experience that uh, have engaged with us some of them are 10 years into the practice and they still were able to get a hang of it and uh, got a hang of the medium and understood some uh, principles of gamification because you know when you're designing a space in vr it's not just about um, creating a world and then just walking through it or navigating through it but you actually design it like an experience you have a start point where you um start and then as you go there are a lot of elements that you can interact with that a lot of elements that you can meddle with and since it's the virtual space you can fly around and you have portals which lead from one point to another so they try to curate different worlds through experiences and that was really fascinating for us to see because everyone has their own creative touch and uh, layer to it without any prior experience beforehand and um do you know any companies right now which are maybe leaders into this field of virtual reality and uh, what are the opportunities of a person like what are the career opportunities in your opinion uh for a person that attends a futurely workshop and spends those uh well do you say six weekends but the weekends are the time you are involved into actively teaching the people but i guess that in the meantime they also on their own uh practice or they will play around with the software so um uh, yeah i was curious about what what are like a, a aside of architecture what are like the possible career paths with this knowledge in your opinion right okay um one of the things is uh, at futurely like i mentioned uh, this is one of the domains that i was a part of and i was able to contribute in the space and uh, again as futurely we are going to target or uh, get into multiple other uh, allied domains in architecture dealing with uh, the professional side of things and fabrication side of things etc but coming to the topic of virtual reality and the kind of opportunities that it holds for architects and designers one of the main areas is that uh, i think virtual space as a, a medium like engaging in virtual spaces is going to be a new normal in a couple of years like how we start having image sharing platforms like instagram and um, videos and app uh, photo sharing platforms like facebook instagram or tiktok we are st- we are going to have a lot more 3d shared platforms in the near future and uh, 
the whole reliance on uh, real time technology and virtual reality is going to increase a lot because of this and especially talking from a design perspective the whole idea of you know the ui ux design so far has been really well mapped out when it comes to 2d interfaces because that's how that's what we've all been experienced with and when we start engaging with vr your whole user experience is spatial and there is a lot of untapped opportunity to learn and experience and even uh, contribute to and the other thing uh, or the other avenue that i obviously would mention is uh, video games which is definitely a sure spot uh, for virtual reality one of the least expected areas that's um, really picking up these days especially during the pandemic is um, the concept of virtual production so cinema short films and other uh, media formats storytelling media formats are all switching to virtual means where you can actually create cameras you can create uh, all uh, the movement patterns and you can almost virtually create a set a physical set and then uh, you can run your whole thing and such kind of opportunities become more and more uh, advanced and more and more uh, sophisticated when they are done through vr uh, yeah maybe in the future we won't have our uh, instagram account with our feed we'll be having our personal world where people will access and experience uh, our our yes. craziness yes uh, i think it, <laughs> i think it's um It's a very interesting topic. I think it's going to be uh, really interesting how it's going to un- unvelop and develop in the next few years. Um, and I'm really, really uh, fascinated by your work and um, by everything you do at um, at Futurely because, um, as I told you, I, I work with uh, with Mado, your wife, and she sometimes I ask her how it's going, and she shows me some some or I follow you on Instagram, and I see the work of uh, you of the students, and uh, it's really really crazy, it's fascinating, and uh, looks looks dope. I can just say that looks dope. Uh, Thanks a lot, Gyorgi. I want to mention in the end of the podcast that all the softwares that we mention are always non-sponsored or something like that. We're just mentioning because it's the matter of the process or the the workflow. And I think we have mentioned uh, most of most of the uh, most of the interesting things. Uh, uh, I think it was very uh, a very interesting journey that you have had and uh, going through on the on the conversation here on the podcast. It's always nice because it generates this sort of Uh, bond <laughs> between me and, and the person who is uh, participating and um, as I said this is just your I always say to the guests that this is the first time you're participating on the podcast and in your case next time I really hope it will be live uh, in person here um, and thank you very much for for accepting my invitation and for participating I totally look forward to that uh, Yorgi we should definitely catch up and do something live as well and uh, thanks a lot for having me join today and and yeah before we we conclude the podcast um can you uh shout out for the people uh, where to find more about you about futurely you can shout out websites or social media where can people find you online for sure for sure Um uh, first of all uh, guys follow the creative insider podcast it's really amazing how yorgi is putting it together and uh, he's getting interesting people and uh, interesting insights and I'm, i think i personally uh, enjoy the experience of having this sort of a super casual and intimate conversation which i have not done in a long time these days and thank you for that yorgi so with that uh, being said all of you can um, find us at futurely.space and my personal profile on instagram is uh, v a m z e e k r r i z that's uh, my profile 
And our website is uh, futurely.space again. And uh, a huge shout out and a huge love for all of you guys who are listening to this podcast. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank, thank you for the kind words in the beginning. I'm not going to shout out anymore uh, my, my own account because you did it for me. That was uh, very, very nice of you. Uh, all the links of your students' works will be in the description of uh, this podcast. All the links you just mentioned are going to be in the description. So you just need to click and you'll get where you need to go. And uh, I want to remind all the people that are listening that uh, also, we don't want you to get to get lost with uh, the attention taken of your task. So, if you don't want to listen to the Creative Insider, but you want to stay up to date on what is going on around and what, who are our guests, and get uh, the best of in a written form, you can go on um, our social media and click our links in descriptions and. Um, Join our newsletter and once a month we're just going to tell you what happened this month and you will decide what to listen or you will just have a recorded best of of what you have already listened. So thank you one more time, Vamsi, and I hope to see you soon. Have a good evening. See you soon, Rocky. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. The whole world stops just like that. Thank you.